Yeah, so welcome everyone. Are you still okay? Um, we 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 appreciate um, having some folks come come just from wherever. Uh, and uh, my name is Brent Bodie, Coach Bodie here at CRI. I'm the head coach for the Novice Girls Program. We've been around for, I guess, since 2009. Uh, and I sort of help put together these symposiums and coaching discussions um, for the better of the coaching community and the rowing community. Um, and I know, yes, yeah, that's Marky. Um, maybe actually, since we're such a small group, I, I don't know. And this might help Tim a little bit, but I'm, you know, I know I'm I'm here. Um, uh, well, maybe we'll introduce ourselves in a minute. I'll introduce Tim, but um, we'll go around the room and sort of say a little bit about what we do and kind of like maybe what we're interested in sort of finding out a little bit about tonight, sure. unless you're going to do that. No, you go ahead. I'll okay. Follow your lead. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll just introduce Tim. This is Tim Morgan. Um, Tim has been with us for a little while. Um, he, your clinic is in Wellesley, is that correct? It's in Wellesley, yeah. Okay, excellent. And uh, and you teach exercise science in a couple of different courses. I'll let you do that for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you guys might have a couple of balls. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think it's going to be kind of cool to listen to some of the stuff that he has to, to share with us tonight. And if we can, we'd like to sort of, um, we'd really love it. And I'll try to sort of be a little bit. If I have questions or you guys have questions, we're really going to try to make it more of like a discussion rather than us just a full sort of full-on presentation. Um, and we can, you know, I think it's just really, really neat to be able to bounce ideas off of people and sort of we all bring uh, our individual sort of experience and so forth and knowledge from different places. And sometimes like it can really help just sort of keep the dialogue really moving forward. So, um, okay, so I'm, you know, I'll be interested to hear a little bit about this and based on like the novice sort of young 12 to 16 year old athletes with very little athletic experience in terms sure. of that perspective. Um, and this is uh, Patrick mm -hmm. Larkin, and I just started coaching military rowing again. It's my second year as the head coach for military sweeps team here at CRI. Um, and so we have a wide range of athletes and uh, people from all walks of life. Um, they can be active duty, young guys, still serving uh, or still in school, all the way to retired um, veterans who've seen it all and, and have been around um, for a while. So definitely a lot of ranges of athletic ability as well as strength and flexibility and they're kind of navigate, trying to figure out how to navigate, you know, getting older. We're also trying to be an athlete and learn a new sport and so. Thank you, Pat. My name is Will. Uh, I'm actually one of the uh, fellows here with the IRL. Um, I volunteer coach with Boston University right down the river. Um, and I guess I'm interested in kind of just learning more a little about everything. I'm um, specifically interested in kind of riding the line between optimal training and overtraining. So if you touch on that, that'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Peter. I'm uh, also in the IRL uh, working with the MIT Open Weight Women. And uh, sort of similar to Pat, uh, just like a huge range. Uh, really, it's also four years high school experience, and there's really, you, you know, you can really predict how they're going to perform, where they've been. You have a lot of data um, behind it, and then other girls that, you know, come in, um, you know, first day, just never kind of being in an organized sport before, and, and really that they're so kind of far outside the charts and diagrams that you know you try to get them all in the same boat um, I'm I'm really interested in yeah in uh, in sort of good sort of predictive workouts that don't uh, sort of like you know the old principle of like when you measure it you change it like if you can get a predictive workout that you don't have to run um, sort of in a transport range but you can still kind of find out what their ability to perform is Sorry, I'm just from Carnival Court. Uh, <laughs> my name's Andy. Um, I'm also amazingly in the IRL. Um, somehow I wonder why. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but seriously, uh, interested in sort of the load uh, put on the on the spines and having a neutral spine versus a curved spine, um, and how that relates to form, and, and then the recovery process of certain yeah. Hi, I'm Marcy, and I'm a scholar at Chess Club, and interested in the whole, um, as a master's level athlete who's um, competitive in the age group, trying to find that balance between, you know, um, optimal training and recovery to prevent 
injury. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, particularly interested in sort of the like, feeling towards the master's level athlete, and and as women also, like it's another like that gender component we see where we put up on the board. If there's really a difference in that, they'll all be masters someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gilder. Uh, I'm another one of the IOL fellows. Uh, I work with the high performance group here at CRI and uh, I'm the novice boys coach at Brooklyn High. Uh, so I'm interested in kind of how to get people to do things early on in their careers, kind of develop good habits and get them to understand it before it becomes a problem. And this is Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Okay, Welcome. my turn. <laughs> um, I'm on the same page as you. I am a novice boys coach at Milton High, and I um, have a background in body work, so I've been really focused on this with them, but I'm always interested to learn more and also to find new ways to communicate with them what I learn. Um, I think coaching is like so great to have a whole lot of different ways to talk to different people, so just how to talk to them about good pain versus bad pain and making sure that like the young ones are getting the education early. Cool. Oh, that's it. So I'm Lynn, I just got back from coaching. I'm Spencer, I'm an IRL fellow, an IRL fellow. I work with the uh, novice boys here in the CRI, I mean the BC novice guys as well. And uh, I'm actually doing a research project about this topic for this class, so I'm interested right. to hear it. And then back row. Uh, my name is Al, member of the Cambridge Book Club. Uh, my wife and I started a program in New Orleans called Orleans Sweeps and Skulls. I want to promote my big race uh, June the 4th in Provincetown, it's on the ocean. Wow. Um, I'm interested in the um, <coughs> training aspect. I was hoping you'd talk about um, you know, the threshold lactate testing. Um, I am a I like to train by my heart rate. I do everything uh, with a heart rate monitor, and I just like to I like to get your philosophy on that, obviously. And um, if you could get give some methods on determining um, what what you use to determine max heart rate without doing the actual testing um, of the the blood, um, I've had you know, the blood work done. Um, we usually have it done once a year, um, but I, I, I just want to get your opinion on some, some ways to find the anaerobic threshold and your uh, max heart rate, I guess, on the ERG. I know there are different methods. I'm just wondering what your, what your uh, opinion was on that. Okay, great. All right, so, well, thanks for having me, Bodhi. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Glad to be back again. Um, it's always great to be in an environment where everybody just wants to just kind of share some information. Small groups are great. So um, I'm glad to do it just as like, you know, discussion and as you as you said, small group. And anytime you guys can offer anything or have particular questions, I might not be able to answer them, but I'll ask around the room and somebody will have an answer for you. So my talk is mostly regarding theories of training and therefore part of the training process is the recovery process. So understanding the timing of it, understanding the demands, the physiological demands of it. Because I think if we, you can really dial down to understanding the process, we can understand where we can jump in and how we can affect it from a training perspective and how we can enhance. So I certainly haven't covered ever, like all of your questions and all your hopes and desires in this, this one PowerPoint, but we can certainly round table or, or discuss anything that's come up. Um, in particular, I don't talk about any injuries or any, uh, you had, I forgot your name, but you had mentioned, you know, neutral spine and, uh, and injury prevention, I believe. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last year. So just trying to stay a little bit focused with, um, and again, I'll certainly, you know, answer any questions in that context but, uh, that, that I can help you with. But um, in the context of understanding the training stimulus and the response that, that we're looking for. So please do ask questions as we go. So I, I borrowed this saying right here. It's an old, seemingly an old French adage when it comes to the Tour de France. 
I don't speak French, but my daughter told me it's Corriere se morir un po', which loosely translates to train is to die a little. So, really interesting because we've all been there, right? So, that's what you do. <laughs> you feel it, and you know you're going to get through it, and you know you're, you feel like you're about to die, but you know there's this process that comes, up, comes after it, and that's, that's what we do it for. So, pretty interesting, and it already shows that there is a direct correlation between all these endurance sports. Bodhi was talking about cycling a little bit earlier, and that's more my background. I'm not a rower. I am a cyclist, so most of my information, or my interest, has always been cycling-based. So, a little background on me. I do have a chiropractic sports practice, sports therapy practice in Wellesley. Um, just been in that in Wellesley for about a year and a half now. Um, aside from that, I'm a part-time faculty at UMass Boston. I teach some strength conditioning classes and kinesiology classes. So, so my world is really a mashup between physical work and understanding of the physiological end. And oftentimes with my clientele, I try to bring the two together, whether it's through therapeutic exercises, therapeutic body work, or just roundtabling and discussing training matters, because I like to deal with active populations. I love to deal with athletes. My practice is, is a wide range of people, but I definitely trend towards the, um, the active individual. All right, so I think as a, as a baseline of it all, I look at things from the stimulus and response model. So really, we're, if, if we're anything, we are biological organisms, just like a single cell organism, we put a stimulus on that organism, it's going to respond. That's how we survive, right? Darwin said it. It's not the strongest. It's not the most intelligent to survive. It's the one that can best adapt to change. So our bodies need to be stimulated, and they will respond. Our, our physiology will respond. Our physical tissues will respond. And that's what training is, right? It's just a matter of finding the right measured dose of stimulus, applying it, applying it with the right temporal nature, being patient, nurturing this response from the body, and, and slowly building our bodies, our athletes' bodies, in, in the, um, the direction that we're trying to lead them in. So there's a little bit of a difference. Behaviorally, conscious thought can intercede between stimulus and response. Biologically, our tissues, they get stimulated and they just respond. But behaviorally, <coughs> you could put a stimulus on somebody and, and they could you know, interrupt or they could intercept your stimulus, your coaching stimulus, and they could respond the way they want, right? But physiologically, tissue is just tissue. It's got a biological drive to it. It's got this evolutionary adaptation drive to it. So if we find the right stimulus, we can carve out of our bodies what we want them to be. That'd be kind of like like um, if you experience an emotion, like humiliation, for example, where your face would go, but you don't have control over that, right? It's not like I'm. I'm yeah, like you don't have control over that, right? Right. It just happens, and you don't even know what's actually happening until someone tells you that your capillaries have opened up. I, I think that's a pretty complex okay. response, right? I mean, there's a lot of things going on there. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is. I think especially from a coaching perspective, perspective, you could ask something of somebody and they could choose not to do it. Or if we directly stimulate through a training process, directly stimulate tissue biologically, taking the conscious mind out of it biologically, it's going to, we've evolved to be what we are because we respond to stimuli. So, um, so the, the outline of the training series, I want to start with Hans Salier's work, just a brief recognition of it. Um, so early, early 20th century endocrinologist, I believe he was Austrian turned Canadian, I believe. Um, so he had a series of um, experiments that he was looking at stimulus response. He was looking at how the body responds to stressors. He termed, the, he termed it stressor. He actually thought he was studying a particular hormone in the body, what he, what he found out later on that it was actually just this physiological stress. So it was a very 
similar kind of response. So he found that when presented with a, a stimulus or a stressor, the body would respond by first becoming depleted and then mounting a response to that, mounting a resistance to it. So I guess on the x-axis here, he was looking at a particular capacity, and we can look at it as a, an athletic capacity. This alarm stage was saying, okay, we're going to put a stressor on the tissue. It depletes that particular athletic capacity, but then it comes back again. Again, he wasn't looking at from an athletic capacity standpoint, but more from a, just a resistance to stress or stimuli. So then out of the... Uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the Russians in the 50s, 40s to 50s, you know, a lot of things came out of their training programs. A lot of things did. Um, for good or for bad. <laughs> but you know, you know, found it in a lot of really good science that we're, we're still carrying forward today. So they started looking at supercompensation. It's the same curve, but now it's applied in the sports science way. So we're looking at an athletic capacity on the x-axis. A stimulus or a training stimulus which depletes that capacity and then a time on the also on the x-axis, a time dependent response. Um, so the slope of the training stimulus, the slope of the recovery can be very correlated. One will drive the other one. Um, as we'll talk about as we go, sometimes the intensity or the volume of that training stimulus is going to drive the effectiveness of the response. So what we want is to stimulate the tissue, get a response out of it, so that it increases its abilities, its capacity. Very specific, right? So we stimulate the body from a strength perspective. The response is going to be a strength response. If we stimulate from a aerobic capacity perspective, the response is going to be aerobic capacity. So very specific uh, and very um, proportional response. That's kind of what we rely on. So we want to go from one capacity, apply a training stimulus. We want to recover, that's our response, to a higher functional capacity, that supercompensation level as it's termed. So we've now compensated to a higher level, higher functional capacity. In the perfect world, we would apply another training stimulus somewhere within this supercompensation period. If we wait too long, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. We've gone back to ground zero again. We didn't get anywhere. So that's the hallmark of a maintenance program, right? So when we, we're, we're okay with our functional capacity, stimulate, respond. If we wait long enough, we're going to come back down again. Train it again. So that would be more of a maintenance level training stimulus if the frequency of the stimulus is not adequate enough to continue to climb the ladder of supercompensation. So the timing of this um, is important as far as what the goal is and, and probably where, the, where we are in the season, that sort of thing. I'm familiar with the time frame for the bottom graph, but the top one I haven't seen. Is that um, over the course of days or is that over the course of hours? Well, you know what? It's, it's a different study, I guess. So it's not really yeah. a super compensation curve. It's just more of a general physiological, biological response curve. So I think that could be over... Like a, work, like a workout? Like measurements taken during a workout or um, later? I've never thought about his curve as far as the time frame. But I think as it applies to this, it's usually more hours to days, yeah. to several days. So as far as his curve is concerned, I would really need to look back and, and see exactly what time frames he was looking at. Not really sure. So supercompensation is just general adaptation syndrome applied in the sports science con context. So with that training, the training stimulus, uh, there's a concept called impulse. If we're talking biomechanics, it's force times time. It's force time. But when we're looking at 
a training stimulus, we can look at the impulse or the, the area under the curve as the impulse of the curve. How, how deep, how strong, how long, what are the different variables of that stimulus? The variables of this stimulus is going to drive the rest of the curve. That's the stimulus that drives the response. The curve to the right here shows three different curves, one that is suboptimal, one that's optimal, and one that is too much of an intensity or too much of a volume, too much of an impulse. So if we undertrain or the stimulus is not great enough, we're not going to we're not going to supercompensate to the level we want, and we're not going to make the progress that we're, we're trying to make. Slow incremental changes, you know, not at the pace that we're looking for. If we overcompensate, with the impulse of this curve being deeper and wider, it changes the slope of recovery. So the greater the training stimulus, it can really change the slope of that recovery and it can lend towards a much longer recovery period. So some bodies are going to be better able at fielding these stressors. A more well-trained body will have a more well-trained endocrine system, hormonal system, will be able to actually tolerate greater workloads, greater stimuli, and be able to have a, an effective slope of, of recovery. However, we do want to be conscious of underloading or overloading as it is going to drive that curve. I learned a new word when I put these slides together. Heterochronism. I had, to, I had to listen to Google Translate to get the right pronunciation <laughs> <laughs> of it. So essentially, it is recognition that all of the tissues that we're stimulating, we cannot assume that they all respond on the same time frame. So this gets to your curve that you're, we're all familiar with 24, 48, 72 hour kind of supercompensation curves. Heterochronism suggests that tissues, even with the same stressor on them, they may have a different response rate. So you put a strain on, on a body, the bone might respond in one, with one rate, muscle might respond, well muscle force might respond with one rate, the neuromuscular connection might be a third rate, physiologically that might be a fourth rate. You know, do they all line up? No. So we can't say the supercompensation curve is perfect. At 72 hours, you're good to go. I always think about it when it's, um, remember those Purdue oven stuff for roasters that would have the little thing that would pop out? <laughs> what do they call it? I don't know. It was like a little heat, thermo heat thermometer or something. If we all had these little things that popped out, it'd be great. It's like, okay, you're ready to go again. But it's not that simple because that might say that your force production is back. But your mitochondrial, you know, your mitochondria are still just torn up. They're just not back. Enzymes aren't ready. You know, whatever it is, we can't we can't assume that they're all progressing on the same time frame. So this, you probably can't read it from where you're at, but this is suggesting that from the same two-hour training stimulus in red, same general shape, right? But the slope of recovery is different. Ten hours for muscle glycogen repletion is possible. Then complex parameter fitness levels, this, you know, all the other uh, fitness responses that we're, we're looking at, probably like intramitochondrial, aerobic, anaerobic, force and power, they might be 24 hours. Okay, so that's markedly different than the first curve. Damage to mitochondria, up to 48 hours, up to eight days. So based on the the intensity of the stimulus or the volume of the stimulus, again, it's going to drive the recovery and, and the tissues might respond differently. So what we have to do is we have to respect the fact that this curve doesn't mean the mitochondria are ready because they're, they're still in a, a state of distress. Even, even though one capacity is ready to go, the others are not ready to go. And there's no absolute measure of all of this. Sometimes it's just recognition that within a training program, we have to start looking at how often we train, how often we train with intensity, how much recovery. Sometimes it's a, a rough estimation, right? It's like, okay, if we go really hard today, we're not going to go really hard tomorrow because I know none of these are ready. But can we go in 48 hours? Well, it probably depends on the volume and the intensity of the stimulus. 
and with your with your um, experience with your athletes, because if you see that they're responding in the training program, you might you know assume that the training program's working and it's sound. But if they're not responding, then you might see that okay, we have to dial this back, we have to spread out, we have to rest more, or we have to change you know the order in which we train during the the course of the week or the 10-day or a 14-day cycle or whatever. And we, we also have to be willing to stretch it out, not, not see everything as a week-long training cycle, right? So if we're training four times a week, and I, I saw a young girl, maybe in one of your boats the other day, and I asked her, and she's, she's 16 years old, skinny as a rail, I know you guys have all seen them, and I asked her how, how often she's training, and she said six to seven days a week. And I just had like a little, uh-oh, you know? It's not causing an injury with her, but it's just concern that, okay, here's a young girl. She hasn't developed from a, a physical training perspective yet. She doesn't have the, the, the hormonal response. It takes years to develop that kind of robust response. And she's now in a six or seven day training cycle, or six or seven days per week. It just raises concern not that I saw any side effects from that training, but it just raises concern that, well, I wonder how this is going to play out with her body. I wonder what her return is going to be. It might not be today, tomorrow, this week. It might be next week. It might be the week after. Like, what's going to happen with this girl? So I think we just need to be mindful that different tissues respond at different rates. Okay, probably getting sick of curves by now, but I love curves. All right, so the next model is the fitness fatigue model. So in the 70s and 80s, Bannister developed this fitness fatigue model. So very similar to the supercompensation. It's really looking at the supercompensation curve, but further dividing it into what's, what's going on behind the supercompensation curve. And he's identifying, Bannister's identifying two separate curves within the supercompensation curve, one that he termed fitness and one that he termed fatigue. So for every stimulus on, on our bodies, we respond with a fitness curve and a fatigue curve. Otherwise called the fitness curve is a, a chronic training load and the fatigue is an acute training load. So there's positive and negative that comes out of every training stimulus. So in the short term, there's fatigue. We've depleted everything we just trained. Acute, short-term fatigue. However, there's a longer-term chronic response that's coming from our bodies if we continue to nurture it along. So fatigue kicks up, and the fitness gains occur right away as well, but they don't get realized right away because fatigue is so high. So we have to wait for fatigue to start recovering. That's going to be a time-dependent process. So as fatigue starts to pass, the elevated fitness gains start to be realized. The fitness gains last three to six times longer than the fatigue gains. So we're supposed to recover from our fatigue as the fitness gains before the fitness gains drop down to the original levels. So eventually, fitness gains are going to come back, fatigue is going to come up, and what we want to do is we want to recover from our fatigue before our fitness gains get lost. So a guy who's known well for distance running, Pete Fitzinger, he had, I just pulled these basic rules off of one of his publications, it takes eight to ten days to get benefits from any workout. I can't, you know, I can't say that this is absolutely true. This is, these are his numbers. Eight to ten days to get benefits from any workout. So today's day on the water doesn't really benefit us tomorrow or maybe even this week. On, on some level, we have to convince ourselves that banking a workout, we all know it's going to be good for us at some point in time, but there's a time-dependent process when we take this stimulus, and another term for it is transmute it, transmutation, turn it into something physiologically that we can use in the future. And it is a time-dependent process largely because we have to wait for that fatigue from the stimulus to dissipate before we can even realize that gain from the fitness. 
eight to ten days to recover from a max VO2 workout, four days to recover from a lactate threshold or tempo workouts, and recovering from long runs takes the longest time. I think that one's debatable at the end. Mm -hmm. Kind of for myself, it's the high intensity stuff that just kills me. It's like I was thinking of you out in the halls at the four. I um, did a high intensity workout on Saturday, and I felt fine on Sunday to go on a long run, but midway through the long run, I realized that the tissue hadn't recovered, and I started getting cramps in my calves, and I was like, oh. Yeah, like <laughs> I, 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 I said, okay. I think this is debatable. <laughs> that, that's my personal stuff. experience, too. Um, like I think if I flipped the order and done a long run on Saturday, I would have been fine to do a high intensity on Sunday. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that high intensity gives a bigger trough of a of a stimulus, yeah. right? And so you have to then respect that time dependent process. And then seeing, seeing your, your graphs and wondering, am I ever going to get the benefit of that <laughs> high intensity? Maybe I killed it <laughs> with the overcompensation. I think if you're kind to yourself and, and, and you're patient, right? And, and you don't at the 48 hour mark, maybe you, you still have to be mindful that, you know what, I'm still only 48 hours or 24 hours out of that workout. I have to stay true to theory and I have to say, okay, let's wait another day. Let's do something else. Is there something else you could do that day? So whether it's more technical work, whether it's whatever, there's you know other lower intensity drills you can do. So maybe you work something else before you start pushing that that red line again. <clears throat> so the fitness fatigue model, again, I'm not going to bore you with too many more um, examples of curves, but they're there and we're waiting for, we're waiting for fatigue to bring us back before we lose this fitness gain. So again, three to six times longer the, the fitness gain lasts versus the fatigue, theoretically. This curve here just shows this yellow zone here is saying, okay, here's an optimal window. So as the fatigue is going away and before we've lost the fitness gain, here's an optimal window for high intensity. So before we've lost fitness, and while the, while the fatigue is going away or gone, there's the opportunity to get that high intensity work back in again. Mm -hmm. So if we wait too long, you know that fitness is going to come down and we don't have that foundation of the fitness to put that high intensity on because we want to constantly be ratcheting up. We don't want to detrain and start moving downwards. So, and on the heels of the fitness fatigue model, a, a guy by the name of Andrew Coggin, and he, he writes a lot about power meters and measuring power, especially in cycling, but it's starting to branch out into other disciplines. How much do you guys see power meters now? I know they're out there. There's force plates and there's oar locks and there's string gates and, and floors. There's so much information that can be from that when the technology is, I guess, more ubiquitous, right? It's going to be, that information is going to start coming in. So I think you guys are probably in that generation that's going to start fielding all of this. And on the heels of the cycling world where every single pro has a power meter built into their bike, eventually they're going to, it's going to trickle down to this level because they're getting cheaper and they're getting a little bit more easy to, um, to access. So he termed the fitness, he termed that the chronic training load. So he started looking at training load. Okay, how can we quantify what we're doing to ourselves? Acute training load, chronic training load. So what, we're, what he was really looking at was this training stress balance. So it's the balance between the acute and the chronic, a balance between the fitness and the fatigue. So what he wanted to start looking at was performance. So considering the acute and the chronic, we really want to be driven by performance. So he started following the performance curve and started to see that, you know, it, start, it, it follows the same curve. It's still, we have to wait for fatigue to go away, fitness to stay up, and it's going to drive that performance right through the middle. Okay, so here is, a supercompensation curve. 
with one on its, you know, belly on its back, belly on its back, belly on its back. So obviously we're trying to ratchet up from an athletic capacity standpoint. If we rest too much, eventually that curve comes back down under our pre-existing level, and then we training from either where we started or from below where we started if we rest too much. So that's you know insufficient frequency of yeah of a, a strong stimulus, whether that's intensity or volume or whatever you're trying to train. It's an insufficient stimulus. However, we could also train too much or <clears throat> either too much frequency or too much intensity with frequency, where you beat the body down, you go into that alarm reaction or that depleted state, and then you train it again. What you're training, you're training on top of a depleted state. So that's your new starting point. So if you train on a depleted state and then train on again on a depleted state, and again, what happens is we start following a curve of overtraining. So now we're, we're actually Overtraining and detraining the body, we're actually diminishing the body's health, responsiveness. Does anybody have any any personal experience with it? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, when I ended up rowing in the indoor world championships, like way, way, way back when, I left in the ambulance. I was one of the dudes that left in the ambulance in the crash feed, and that was as a result of the. I had a great fall season, and then going into December, January, and February, I just started training harder, not smarter, and I, I ended up, I was able to... It's the opposite of wisdom, right? It's, it's yeah. It's like you were living in the moment. Exactly. More than that, you know, I maintained the speed, but as soon as it was over, it was like, my body was like, sorry, sucker, like, right. you've been, you've been uh, taking too much out of the bank for a long time, right. and now it's time to pay. Did you hear? I did. <laughs> <laughs> but that was probably more luck than anything else, because I had only had like three of them before that, so, yeah. But I think in the, you have to, especially in a coaching perspective, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, you have to consider the context of your whole athlete's life, like everything that's going on in their life, right? Mm. I have an experience with this, and I didn't even know what was going on. My per, To put it in a nutshell, my personal experience was, I was relatively new to cycling within five or six years, and I wanted to race more, and I wanted to, you know, I started having these thoughts of moving up and being a you know, successful master's racer, that sort of thing. So I was working long days, so I could train from 5 to 6.30 in the morning, and I'd go out every morning and time trial every morning. I would just go hard every morning. And you know what? All these other stresses in life, finance, job, marriage, kids, pending divorce, like, I mean, it, it all kind of comes around. I mean, it's, it's all stress. It's life stress. And Hans Salier's curve, the original curve, is just a stress curve. It's not a training curve. All the stress on our body, it's stress. It's, your body feels every bit of it. Good stress or bad, it feels it. So a good stress, your body feels it. Physiologically, it feels a good stress, and it has to respond to it. Physiologically, it feels a negative stress what he termed distress, and it has to respond to it. So it's a physiological load on your body. The more stress on your body, it's just not going to respond. It's going to start getting depleted. That response curve is going to be very flat. <clears throat> so to finish my personal story, that's what I did. I time trialed every morning. I did like lactate threshold work for an hour and a half every morning, think that this is going to make me stronger. And that August, the first time I ever had seasonal allergies. Sinus infection, I was done for the year wow. in August. The next year, I did the exact same thing again mm -hmm. because I had to make up for lost time, right? Same thing happened again. Sinus infection. I remember being in a race and I just like dropped to the back of the pack so fast and I was just like choking up and I was spitting up all sorts of things. I'm just like, I just peeled off after like, you know, one circuit. I'm just like, what happened to me? I was sick. But I got there because I just depleted myself. Mm -hmm. So more intensity, more, even if it was well-intended in intensity, it just, physiologically, it just stripped me of everything that I had. Mm -hmm. And I was unhealthy. I was, on the heels of that, I was, I felt ill for a year, a, a solid year. I'd fall asleep at any given moment. I was told I was depressed and irritable, hence the divorce. 
So all these things start to mount, and that's what overtraining syndrome starts to sound like. And that, that was my personal experience. I didn't even know what it was at the time. I didn't recognize it. Others recognized it in me. I just knew that I fell asleep all the time, and I, if I looked at my bike, I'd get nauseous. I'd just like, I don't even want to see it. You know? Mm -hmm. So there was something guttural in me that was just saying, you know, you're done, you're cooked. That's the danger of overtraining is it's real, it does come, it comes slowly, but then it's there. So usually it's too much stress on the whole, whole being, too much stimuli that we just cannot tolerate. So it's like anything, if there's too much going on at one point in time, things fail, right? He just realized that that's a Windows message on an application. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is a special really long week. Overload. Over 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 I mean, if you got 22 tabs open, if if <laughs> if your processors are spinning and you keep opening tabs and you keep doing things and it's just more, 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 this is what happens and and you don't realize it until it happens. Then you're like, oh. Yeah. You know, like, how do I get out of this? How much is it going to cost me? How long am I going to be down for, right? It's what it is, and, and that's exactly what it feels like. So, mindful of that. Hopefully, I can get up a little bit now. <laughs> gotcha. So, mindful of the process is the message. Any comments or questions? And I'm 41 to kind of. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I used to coach track, youth track, and. Um, that whole irritable, um, low response, low aspect sort of, um, it's really important to read your athletes for that kind of stuff because kids are, it's not just the kids that are ambitious, sometimes the culture of the team is ambitious and these are the best parents that are ambitious and it's really hard to pull back and I realize as a coach, you don't lose talent. Talent's going to be there but you might lose a kid because they fall into that same kind of big hole that you're talking about and that these were interest, right? Right. And the whole the hardest thing to do in the midst of that culture was to hold it to back. But you know, that's what you had to do. The kids not gonna lose her ability to jump or to throw or whatever, but she might lose her interest completely in the sport <laughs> if I don't learn how to hold her back. Mm -hmm. Not always push, push, push to do and the, the I think the complicating <laughs> part too is not to get too far into overtraining syndrome, but there's there's 180 degree polar opposite symptoms, whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic dominant overtraining. So it could be depressed appetite, it could be eating too much, it could be not sleeping enough, it's, too, it's sleeping too much. So sometimes it's hard to actually pick it up. But when you see, you know, an accumulation of like sympathetic fight or flight kind of response versus a syndrome where you get a collect, collection of parasympathetic response, at least the sympathetic, which one seems worse? Mm -hmm. What's the question? If there's two major types of overtraining, sympathetic versus parasympathetic, and this, this is assuming you have yeah, you had, heard that. these words before, right? We heard these Fight or flight that's sympathetic that's right. or yeah. parasympathetic brings the body down. So yeah. suppressed exercise profiles, heart rates, uh, appetite, maybe weight gain. Okay. It's the worst because your body has stopped fighting. It, it, it doesn't even care anymore. It's just like, whatever, I'm done. So usually, usually you'll see a progression from sympathetic, and if it's a further progression of going to parasympathetic, sometimes it can be flip-flopped. So you just have to recognize patterns. So that's, that's another little thing that can pop up in your athlete is symptoms. So how do you even know if you're not, I mean, how do you feel this from your athletes? Get to know them. So you, you can track performance. You can track performance. Performance curve starts to dip, and like, hmm, <laughs> we're almost at that. That could just mean that the training program is not working, yeah. too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But you have to think, hmm, it's one athlete, and, and you see curve, and it's kind of tanking, or plateauing, and you think, okay, something's up. But I think getting to know your athletes, too, and having a relationship with them, and you know, you you recognize how they're acting or how they're interacting with others. You know, there's there's social cues that you can pick up on. It's not always that that um, apparent, but you know, you could have them maybe tracking some other things as simple as resting heart rate um, or some other things that we'll talk 
cut you on a little bit. Okay. All right, so you doing okay, Woody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maybe 20 minutes. Okay. So you guys heard of TRIM before? Okay, so this is Training Impulse, TRIM. This is developed by Bannister, the fitness fatigue curve guy. This is, we, yeah, we, we, in our training plan development class, we just kind of did a different version of this. Or this, it, this it, wasn't, wasn't different it wasn't versions. named as such, but yeah, like. Sometimes it was, it's volume load or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, total, total load. Okay, so, so if, the, if the depth and breadth, I guess, of the training stimulus is gonna drive the response curve, we have to be conscious of that, that stimulus, right? So we have to be conscious of training load, volume load, trim, training impulse. Impulse being the, the intensity times a volume of a work load. So um, this is an impulse curve. So this is a force time impulse curve, but we can look at that same impulse curve as a training load curve. And in the supercompensation model, if you flip that, you start to see that that impulse curve looks like the bottom of that, that training stimulus curve. So we want to be able to somehow track, be mindful of how much intensity multiplied by volume that these athletes are, are being exposed to. And especially with novices, like if it's their first time through it, I mean, are they even hormonally able to respond? You know, so how much of it is a uh, deleterious load and how much of it is, is a, a stimulus to them, really? So we can be simple and we can say, let's just look at volume of time. So time on the water. Okay, that is a volume. It might not be the best volume, but it is at least a volume. And the simplest, most non-technological way to measure this is just asking their, their rating of perceived exertion, right? So 30 minutes after a training session, ask them how hard today's training effort was. So, you know, was it really hard? Was it sort of hard? Was it easy? You can put a number on it. So that is a subjective measure. So your subjective measure and your subjective measure are non-comparable, really, but your subjective measure is probably fairly repeatable amongst you know, your reports, right? So perceived exertion times a volume of time on the water. So if it's 90 minutes on the water and that was a six today, you can say, it, they're arbitrary units, but you could say, you know, 90 times six is 540, right? And that is correct. So that is a number. That's a training load number that you can use. That was the level of stimulus that you put on this athlete today. It could be 90 times five, 450, but that was her. So it was very specific to her. It's a training load specific to her. So if we look at, again, how much intensity times volume, we're getting an idea of what we're putting on the athlete because then we're gonna see how they're responding. And if they're not responding well, we have to manipulate something and we have to know what we can manipulate. We can manipulate the number, the trim number. So 540, maybe we wanna bring that down to 400. How do we do it? Well, we can take away volume or we can take away intensity. So this, it's starting to look at things, ways that we can intervene and manipulate the variables of the training stimulus. Um, what sort of training zone would that be best suited for? Making that, making that sort of judgment call. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm not understanding the majority of your like you want or and or that sort of thing. Uh, you know what? If we go, you guys do that in cycling. You must have training zones in your cycling. Yeah, there's, I'm going to okay. introduce okay. a few here. Uh, it depends what you're looking at too, right? So this is just looking at perceived right. exertion. Okay. But we can look at heart rate. In cycling, we can look at power. That's coming to rowing. I mean, it's coming far right. faster than you realize. It's coming. Yeah, and those numbers that you just you're going to get flooded with numbers. And luckily, there's software that just crunches it and gives you a number, which is great. Um, so one of the beauties of perceived exertion, it's a subjective report. I guess in, 
in that it's a subjective report, you can use it as an objective number, but it's still subjective. So it's also getting like a psychological report from the athlete as well, right? So it's kind of, you're seeing if they're distressed, it, you know, you're seeing their, their psychological response for the training as well. So on some level, that's a, that's a benefit. Um, it's not so precise, it's not hard data, it's not, you know, numbers that get crunched and uploaded and spit back out, you know, with a, with a particular um, training prescription like some of the softwares, uh, especially the cycling software can do out there. So then we can look at heart rate, same thing. We can still look at volume, we can look at time, we can look at heart rate, we can look at average heart rate, we can look at how much time you spent on the water, what was the average heart rate. Okay, so heart rates are everywhere. I mean, heart rate monitors are everywhere. Um, pretty low barrier of entry, right? So people can pick up a heart rate monitor and they can easily get an average heart rate out of it. So you can get an average heart rate for the day or you can look at, you know, pieces of work and get average heart rate per pieces of work per work efforts, right? So you can start to look at, okay, now we can quantify a volume of work and the average heart rate, and we can make you make that an index, a training load index. We can look at, you know, the average heart rate times the volume of time. So that's that's creating a trimp number, a training impulse number based on heart rate. But what is heart rate? It's a response. It's a response. It's not output, right? Right. And this is my. If I can just interrupt for just a second. This is. My, my biggest um, quandary with training and growing is everything is given to me in the zone. And I don't like to go by a heart rate monitor. And I, I just have like, maybe it's because I'm too old school. But I feel like I can have a really stressful day um, and then start in zone five by my heart rate monitor. I haven't even taken a step. <laughs> yeah, so, so that if it's a stressful day and if you're resting, heart rate changes. Right. So, you know, you might have to look at like heart rate reserve rather than just mm -hmm. pure heart rate. Mm -hmm. and I think but it's still it's still a response and it's still less exact than looking at an output. Well, I like to look, I guess that's kind of where I'm getting going. I like to look at output more. I think that's from my running background, that's what I would look at. But how, how do you look at it in running from an output perspective? Well, I, I would, I would um, time. You know, so performance. Performance, yeah. It's not as much output, but it's performance, right? Right. So I use the same sort of methodology on the water. And I'm like, okay, I did such and such a distance, such and such a time. I don't but that's real. I mean, you could you could have a GPS that's giving you mm -hmm. velocity. You could just have, you know, a piece on the water, and you know your PR for this, or you know where you, where you want your team to be. So PR for you, or or whatever your norm is, right? Or if you're coaching with a team, you de you determine how much time it is from here to here. You have a log of what that usually is. And if you want to dial up the intensity, it's going to shorten up, whatever. Right. So you can look at performance, and you could turn that into a trip. You know, so you just have to might have to be a little more inventive, and you might have to go off the grid a little bit to do it. But you can do it. It might not be a number that stood out at you like a heart rate number. A heart rate is just a number, okay, now multiply it by a time and we got an index. That was the training impulse, but you can do it with performance. But, and just to play devil's advocate, my understanding was even, the, you know, we call heart rate a response, that in some ways the, the impulse is also a response, like it's a measurement of the response of that stress to your system. I don't and think the say, impulse is a response. I think well, that's impulse something you put on. Right, we're right. But just to say, like, the, or, or to say the, you know, the, um, to go back to super compensation or fitness fatigue model, that those are less, those, what those are really measuring in hard to quantify ways are what, to what degree was this a stress in your system? And why, you know, at least us as coaches, we like to use heart rates is you have, you know, 35 kids coming in with a completely different Tuesday. You come in and you say, do this at this, at this heart rate. That's the same stress response for them, regardless of if they slept, you know, six hours, nine hours, or, you know, broke up with their girlfriend last night, or ate the perfect kind of pre-practice meal that you, you kind of normalize or kind of create a, you know, a, yeah, normalized response to the whole team. But I, so I guess that, 
that would be, um, you know, if you like knowing your own body, I think that's that's why, you know, that's why like going by sort of performance could work. But to say like if ever there is a time where like the variable is like, oh, I'm not sure how it's going to be today, that like I, I'm still just kind of a fan of the heart rate model. And there's nothing wrong with using it. This is not saying that you can't use it. It's it's valid, you know. I mean, heart rate can be a valid way of measuring or uh, obtaining a trim. It is, but what I'm saying is it's still not an output. It's a response, right? So your heart rate can change. Your heart rate to a particular workload can change from day to day. Um, it can change depending on the state of training or the state of rest, all sorts of things. So it, it's not very... It's not super reliable from a day-to-day -day perspective, and it's still, it's still what it's saying is this is your physiological response to that work. It's not this is how much force or power you put out. Okay, but then my question would be: Should the work be more consistent, or the heart rates from that sense? Because if we're trying to get, uh, see, I, I, I think I defer. I, I tend to fall back on, on uh, creating more consistent workloads. Okay. Um, it's not an absolute though, because mm -hmm. people use heart rate and it's been used for years, you know, um, and you'll probably have to use it for years. Um, it's it's still a it's still a measurable uh, determined trim, you know. You can still determine the the intensity and volume of that training stimulus, and that is a variable that you can play with. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I have another slide on on power. Mm -hmm. The same zones, you know. That I think we go up to like seven zones in power, but um, again, it's borrowing from the cycling world. But it's it's largely the same. Um, I just I guess I'm a little bit biased by the the move in the cycling world to go everything is power now. You know, you, you might also collect heart rate. All the power meters will, you know, interface with heart rate monitors and whatnot, so you can look at them all. But I think if you boil it down, looking at the power, you know the output. That's a that's a standardized piece of work that you're doing. That is what you're putting on the athlete. This is what I want you to do. I want this output from you. I think that's what Matt Nair does with the women's competitive team. You get all these ERG numbers, um, different time trials. From 5K to 1K to peak power, but then she really wants the force production. I think she has pieces in that way also. Mm -hmm. I have a super novice question. I hope novice. you all forgive me for this. We don't have heart rate monitors. Um, sometimes I have them take their pulse. How accurate is that? Like, how quickly does your heart rate drop after you take a break? I used to know, and I don't anymore. I'm I don't know sure. the number of how quickly, it, but okay. it, obviously this is this, there's some this decay reliable? there. It's going to happen fairly mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a sign of fitness is how quickly it drops. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and you're asking 15, 16 year old girls to to take. Yeah, I mean, if there's like a reporting error, there's an experience. Yeah, true. So there's, it's not the most accurate, but it's something. But are you What are you using it for? Um, just for them to have kind of a sense of themselves. And it's an education. Yeah. I mean, they start looking at it. Yeah, it's so to it's get a, them it's mind. It's a precursor to understanding something else, I think, if nothing else. So it's, yeah. it, it's, not, it's not a bad idea. I think it's a good, in lieu of a heart rate monitor, you know, I think, it, you know, to do a little bit more of the legwork and understanding something might go a long way with kids, too. Okay. Lucy? Do, do you work with just the girls? No, I actually work with just the boys. Just the boys. Um, okay. So one thing is that that is gender specific and it's generally age specific. So you're not working with a huge varied sort of population. So you may be able to get a couple of accurate numbers and be able to sort of just guess and maybe that that would be the same through the group. You know what I mean? Like that, You mean just the measurements from a few, yeah, few boys? Yeah, I, I, I mean, one time when I was working with a whole, I mean, I had college freshmen and they were all either 18 or 19 years old and they were all female. And I had them all do like their own heart rates, but I did everything sort of separate. And then after collecting all the data, you know, it's 35 of them, and I'm like, oh, look at that, they're almost all exactly the same. <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 you outlier, and then maybe we picked up some sort of cardio thing. 
<coughs> like for the most part, that would I could kind of generally just say, okay, so almost everybody's around the same age and the same gender, like it's likely that something close to that's going to be usable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think in big groups it gets, it gets tricky to do that because if you assign a training load based on you know that collection of data. Mm -hmm. A few of the outliers are going to be underloaded or overloaded, right? So somebody's getting lost there. Right. Somebody's getting an insufficient or a excessive stimulus. Right. So right. And, you know we can fairly easy, easily predict what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. Or response. Yeah. You said you were <coughs> leaning towards uh, power mm -hmm. versus uh, heart rate. Can you explain why? Again, because I'm calling it an output rather than a response. So if you do a work effort, if you, a heart rate is, is really just a physiological response in attempt at perfusing the body with more oxygen. Mm -hmm. Whereas power is a measure of the work that you're doing, the force that you're doing over a time period, essentially. But, but before you start the workout, you have a goal. Is your goal to do a certain power output? Or is your goal to train at, at or the threshold just above, just below? What, what's no, the goal? I, think, I think regardless of the goal, it's establishing a trim, an impulse, a training impulse, and how can we best kind of normalize that or standardize that? And I think the power and time and within these power zones, which I'll put up another chart, but it's very similar to that one, it's just a way to assign a workload. Because because the heart rate there's gonna be some variability. Yeah, that's that's my whole point. That's that's my whole point. Because of the day, because of what happened before, the the heart is is gonna respond differently. Yes. So the number that you might want to get, it might be perceived supposedly to be easy, yet it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, and that tells you something, doesn't it? Well, yeah. It, okay, yes, it does. It, it does tell you something because if you assign a workload and you're also measuring heart rate and you're not getting, your heart rate's too high, it's too low, it's telling you that the body is giving you a sign. It's saying that there's some sort of stress on, the, there's a stress in the body, you know, you're putting a workload on you, but we're not responding the way so, you think I should. So then why not go by the heart rate? Because isn't the heart rate telling you how your body's responding to the workout? You, you can, it's not right or wrong, it's just... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I mean, uh, well, I think because it's a response, mm -hmm. it's harder to be able to rely on that quantified response as a training stimulus. Mm -hmm. Because well, it can vary. You're right, but it varies based on your conditioning that day. Like like you said, some days you're more fit than others and maybe you did too much the day before. Therefore if but, but what are you also trying to train? You're trying to train <laughs> You know, power and output is what's going to make the boat go faster. Mm -hmm. So if that's if that's the end, you know, game is power. So you can look at that, and if your if your your heart rate numbers, if your internal response is off based on what you're trying to train, that's something's right. not right. So it might be you have to manipulate the training program in order to sync those two numbers together. I think you can use them together. Mm -hmm. I, I know you can use them together, but it's just. And again, there's no right or wrong. It, it's just there's a bit of movement towards power for sure. So you're saying the movement is going more towards power than heart rate, rate versus response. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, a lot of you said that you did the blood work and stuff like that. That's correct. So did you do like a step test or? No, on the machine, a lactic uh, test. You know, take the blood from yeah. the ear yeah. and yeah. three eight minute pieces on the earth, yeah. and I have specific numbers that. That I use. So, if you if you mean if you're able to yeah. kind of track where that lactate threshold occurs with your heart rate, and you can also kind of just look at the what you're putting out in terms of what. Right, but that varies day by day. So, uh, 
200 watts or two minute pace, basically what you did today may be in your heart rate is say 150. But tomorrow you might go at a two minute pace and it's 160. And that's above the anaerobic threshold. So you're training something different. If the goal is to train at an anaerobic threshold and it's 155 and you're but going But you can look at your threshold as a, as a power number too. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's an empty here, a functional mm -hmm. threshold power. That's correct. So this is the power you can hold for, on, on a bike you get on to do a one hour time trial. You know, whatever you can hold for an hour can be a measure, that's said to be a measure of your, your FTP or your functional threshold. Yes, yeah. but, but, that, but that's, that, that's what it was that particular day. So the next day, it may not be that. So what I'm, tr I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to understand is if I, if I want to be at my anaerobic threshold, which is say 155, and it's a, let's say it's a two minute pace, that's what it was when I was tested. But when I'm training, I'm training at a 155. Sometimes maybe I can go a little bit better than a two minute pace, and sometimes I go a little bit worse. You with me? So I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm training right at my anaerobic threshold, but that varies, but it's different output, as you're saying. The output's going to be different every, every time I do it. I mean, that's what I see all the time. And, I, and I'm wondering, am I, am I, what I'm doing, is, is it right? It's not wrong. I don't, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, <laughs> you're still going to be in the ballpark if yeah. you're not. Yeah. But, but if, you're, if you're telling someone... They're going to be correlated, usually. Yeah. But if you're saying, okay, I'm going to go, I, today is to go at a two minute, a two minute pace because that's supposed to be my anaerobic threshold. I want to train anaerobic threshold. And I go at a two minute pace and my heart rate is 165. So I'm really not at my anaerobic threshold. Mm -hmm. So my point is, do you back off and go at 165 or do you keep it at the two minute pace? Now I, I think you should go at the 155 because if you go at the two minute pace, you're well above your anaerobic threshold and you're working too hard. Does it say like it, it all depends on like where in this training curve you are? So if you're if you're super compensated, that being at if you, like if basically the argument is saying which which sort of fact do you start with, and and how do you define that workout? So if the workout is defined as the the two minute split workout, that would be easier in the super compensation phase than it will where that's in a different zone in the in the when you when you're fatigued when you're kind of down on the grass. But to say that keeping this in mind, you're defining that training program based on just the power output, um, sort of that, that is the primary factor, not sort of the subsequent heart rate range that you're in. So to say if the goal were to be at lactate threshold, that would be you would start at heart rate. But if the goal is to be at two minutes for a particular amount of time, sort of regardless, that could mean something very different in sort of this area of the curve versus this area of the curve, but that's just sort of the, the school of thought that like, like within this month we want to hit this amount of output, power output, um, versus we want to be at just below threshold for this amount of time. That would be sort of the two ways of looking at it. I think. I can also look at it too if you, if your body's well rested and you take a one-time measurement of your power and you know what your body can put out. It's like a standard number, it's a gold standard, it's established, that's what your body can put out, it's a sort of valid test, so now you know what it can do when rested and when able, it's not going to vary that much, you, you know you can do that, so it's a, it's a more consistent number, so falling back on that power number might be more consistent than a, than a heart rate that can vary. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man, how many times you tell me. I, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, yeah, I'm not telling you. I'm talking about <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I keep listening, and I, I guess I don't hear what I want to hear. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe until the, until the ability to measure rowing power becomes more substantial and more accessible for folks, right. it will be less, you know, you'll just, like, as we move on in technology to figure out, like, what actually is happening, you can, you can go from, like, okay, so yeah. right now, Close enough is heart rate, and then as we get closer to better technology and the ability to measure it more accurately, then we can start to move towards that as the gold standard of right. training. So it, in cycling, it's like, okay, you have 
you have a power meter that grabs these numbers and you upload it and the software will crunch those numbers it will give you average per you know right. pieces right. of work mm -hmm. and, and it sets numbers for you and it, and it can assign you know prescriptive workouts for you mm -hmm. so it's like it's super convenient and they're, they're basing it on power it's super convenient so it is definitely going to come into rowing it's just a matter of time when it gets a little bit more accessible yeah. you know when that barrier of entry is you know hundreds of dollars not right. thousands of dollars you know yeah. seems like a cool. kind of the problem here is or the question is identifying where you are on any given day relative to where you were on the test day both in health and rest and all mm -hmm. those things and also <laughs> whatever training effects you've experienced so uh, I guess to go back to Peter's kind of interest in sort of being able to test that without affecting it and just kind of being able to observe that like that's and that's that's the gold standard to really get you kind of where you want to like to give you the answer the right the right answer to this point I think like you're both direct from both directions you're sort of getting pretty close right um, so you just kind of it's, I think it's just knowing yourself. In terms of training, like progress, if you reach the same or more um, output with less response, then you can say you improved your fitness. Well, and, it's like the simple way to think of it. And also, I mean, yeah. max heart rate is not, it doesn't change that much. I was thinking more like if you can hold a two minute yeah, no, below I, heart rate, I, I, I know, that's I, I know, and, but I'm saying like, Max heart rate, even with training, it doesn't change. It's like it's mm. sort of max up, but doesn't move. So. Right, right. So that, like that's like that's not going to get better. Like, but but max output will change. Right, right, exactly. I mean, training is going to get you stronger, more right. powerful. Right. Yeah. So it will change. So an occasional test, you know, has to be done in order to reestablish those numbers. Right. But the beauty of software is it can capture your race information. So you go out at race pace, it captures that performance, and you worked at your lactate threshold. Mm -hmm. You know, you worked right there, so it captures that and says, okay, this is the power you put out, and you're able to put this out on race day, so this is probably your, your threshold. So that's the beauty of um, that kind of software is it can grab it and it can, it can calculate it for you. Uh, like by the time we solve this, we're going to have a little meter that just tells you your blood lactate level. I've seen a little label. I've seen like a sticker uh, yeah. that, that turns color. Possible. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it turned color. And the coach is like, turn it down. Just like, mm -hmm. You just need the field. It may be like five one minutes. <laughs> okay. Are we the rest? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so we've already talked about power-based trim. Okay. Yeah. That's what it is. Okay. Those are the numbers. Yeah. Um, so, and we've already touched on this, just considering the athlete in totality and all of the different things that are pointing at them. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with everything. And we've only talked about training. And there's all sorts of other things that have to be considered that are, are real stressors on the body. It will play with that slope of recovery. So you just have to be mindful of it, watchful, and you have to be able to monitor your athletes um, as best you can. So how do you know when you're when your athlete is recovered. Yes, know them. And they say what? And they say, I feel great today. Is it possible that they're psychologically ready, but they're... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, sure. You know, there's yeah, different curves, right? right? Yeah. They think they're ready, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Their mitochondria are like, no, no, no. We need another week off. Mm -hmm. Output. Performance. I guess you run the risk of putting them out there and asking them to perform in a... In a non-ideal state. In a non-ideal state, right? Yeah, we used to, so uh, on the an old sort of training sheet, we used to have uh, one of our former coaches used to ask the athletes, and this was generally during the winter training when we were on the herbs all the time, so it was a very consistent stimulus. It yep. wasn't like on the water where you were starting to stop turning. So, but in the beginning, we were like, on a, you know, kind of like, how do you feel on a scale of like one to five? And then after the workout was over, he would ask, how do you feel on a scale of one to five? And it was kind of like to catch those, potentially like if your performance was good, obviously you're going to probably feel better about what you're feeling at that moment. So 
but you report after and you report before. And those were the ways that he was able to sort of like it, it's, it's subjective, but it's yeah. real. That, that's one yeah. way to, I mean, you can ask. Yeah. You can ask. Um, there are other methods that are being used now to, to grab like neurologic readiness. You know, one's called heart rate variability. If you guys have played around with that yeah. at all. So looking at which, what is what is driving your your which nervous system, which autonomic nervous system, sympathetic or parasympathetic is dominating, which one's driving your heart rate. So a lot of variability suggests that it's more parasympathetic dominant, and that's generally suggestive of more recovered athletes. So you know, for a relatively low barrier of entry, you can get into looking at that, and athletes can track that on their own, and it's pretty turnkey. It tells them when to go, when to stop. There's another one, galvanic skin response. It's the same thing. It's like it's for skin um, conductance, just based on essentially perspiration, therefore sympathetic stimulus of the body. So there's different ways of measuring neurologic readiness, and that can be a, a beacon, I guess, to say, is this body, at least on a neurologic level, has it come back down to ground zero? That might not speak to all the curves, but at least it's an attempt to measure something. It's, it's one, of the, one of the things that pops out of the chicken, right? I keep coming back to heart rate. Now. Oh, I want your opinion. <laughs> In the morning, when one takes their heart rate, um, it's pretty much the same every day. So my point is, if on a specific day, if it's higher, obviously, you, in my opinion, you haven't recovered. Resting heart rate rate's still valid. I mean, yeah. that's, that's an old school but valid way to do it. I mean, a simple, you know, simple way to do it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it's real. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, if it's if your resting heart rate is 54 and you wake up and it's 62, it's like Okay. I was the rule of thumb. I always ten beats. Uh, more than ten beats, it's too high. Is that your rule of thumb, or that's? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, but what about quality of sleep? Like I know when I was over training, I woke up more often. I woke up a lot more often during the night when I was trying to get a good night's sleep, and it, and it, no matter what I did, I mean, I did. Right. So there, there's sleep monitoring devices that are easy enough. So. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, when you're not a student, is everybody going to need sleep monitoring? Maybe not, you know. Um, but there are things you can start to look at, and there, there are tools out there that you can start to, if you want to try to circle that athlete with, with everything, you can try to, you know, cherry pick a few things to um, try to ascertain where they're at. So if, if you see that they're sleeping well, okay, take that off, off the you know, off the list of considerations. You know, if you want to talk to them, are they having some, you know, social life issues? How are they doing in school? These are questions just to kind of, to try to identify what, what stressors are around this person. And the more you get to know them, just being around them, you can probably pick up that something's not right. Um, yeah, I, I do think it's important that, for, like for our, I know for our kids a lot of times, they're um, they're getting up at 5:45 a.m. and you know they go to school and they face social stress and academic stress and the future stress yeah, so when they're going to bed. So yeah, and then they get say, they'll say they're going to bed at 11, but really no, it's they're one o'clock. Yeah, they're, and they're, they're from one to five. So they're going to bed at 11, but they're yes, they're, exactly, they're, exactly. exactly. Yeah. This is under the covers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's one of the one of the yeah, maybe Q&A. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I have a recovery question from the training. Um, is, is, is there actually a literature as to whether it's better to take a recovery day or just a deload period in between your training schedules? Or does it really matter if you are varying the intensity of your work? Well, I think it's probably important to, you know, Okay, I don't think I'm going to get to it, but my last slide here is mm -hmm. kind of making a comparison between music theory and training theory. Because there's, if you think of what music is, it's just, it's notes, right? Mm -hmm. Pictures and sounds. But what's <laughs> make, what makes music music and noise noise? Melody and harmony. So timing, how, how they flow rest together. beats, okay. space between notes, mm -hmm. right? So, so within a training cycle, I think. You're going to want your your rest days, your recovery days, 
but then you might scale that up to a block of training, and you might say on the fourth week we're going to a deload week. So you can, it's just a matter of time, whether you're looking at a day, a week, a month, we're still going to want cycles. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can have a deloading week where okay. trim comes down, okay. but within that week you still might have rest days. But it's just a week that's just overall less taxing on the body because you're, you're still trying to accumulate. Remember those numbers, eight to ten days, and some will say weeks. Like, uh, like what are taper programs? Like, what do you use to for taper programs? Maybe two weeks. Two, <coughs> two weeks? A week, yes. ten days, two weeks. You know, it takes a while to, to take all those physiological gains, back off, and let them come. They will come, but you, it is a time-dependent process. So I think they can be deloading and they can be days off. Philosophically, they're kind of the same thing, giving the time, the body time to recover, but they're, they're different in how they play out over time. Wow. So yeah, so the, I, I just wanted to, so the, is there, what other um, variables that we have when we kind of mess around with these kinds of things? No, no, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? So time, yeah, the total time. And I know as rowing coaches, like at that would probably be in terms of what we're trying to achieve, right? We have we have limited contact with people. Um, right? So that might be like a pretty like what do we do with that time? You know, what's the appropriate stimulus with the available time that I have? And then monitoring these things. Frequency. 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 Okay. Right, how frequent. Well, rest, whatever right. form it exists. Rest, right. Yeah. That would be the new that, right? Okay, right. Rest periods, right? So even even in a simple three by ten bench press, you can you can manipulate the amount of rest period between the ten repetitions, right? What about um, I'm trying to think like what about the difference between um, uh, like strength training, quote unquote, versus endurance training. Like, how much? How much would we put in? Uh, and this would obviously depend on the level of athlete. But you know, how much time would you dedicate towards? You know, like let's say weightlifting. And does so it even matter? I mean, these are I'm sure these are like really global questions. But weightlifting, how much time would you do that versus like herbie? Like, would would it matter? Right. But, that's a totally different stimulus, I'm assuming, right? So, well, varying, varying <coughs> training modes I mean, can be a variable, mode, right? A mode, that would be the other thing, right? Right. Huh. That's cool. I mean, I know for novices, Lucy probably feels this way too. I mean, you just gotta get them. You know, get them pointed in the right direction and keep them engaged for as long as humanly <laughs> possible, and then you know see what happens. But um, but I'm sure like so that so I know now that like uh, we use on the varsity women's team uh, the total time, the number of minutes per week <coughs> is essentially like the way Sky breaks up his training program. And I know that there are different but levels. But there's quality of the minutes, right? Yeah. It's you can be in zone three, zone one, that's a different quality of minutes. Correct. Right. But so we, that's, that's the concept of trim. A minute okay. isn't a minute unless you've assigned it an intensity. Right. Okay. So developing that index. Right. But I do, I do know that there's like a, this week we've done this many minutes, and over the course of three weeks we're going to do this many minutes because it's periodized at that point of the season that we should be doing that many minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, I guess that would just be the total volume. It's, yeah, it's, and a, then, it's a quantity, it's a volume. Yeah. It, it doesn't speak to the quality of the volume. Right, each of the components. And, and, and that's some of the, yeah. you know, the most important parts is the quality, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that affects the essential, I mean, that affects the holy grail. I mean, right. <laughs> that's what we're all trying to figure out. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we're all trying to figure out how the optimal. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you could minimize your, your high intensity to the, the smallest amount to get the maximal benefit, isn't that what right. we're in? Masters, isn't that what we want? Right, exactly. It's like the highest amount of recovery for the work that I know I have to do, and then like how much do I have to do because I need to hit all those <coughs> benchmarks. Right, so that, so that that curve continues to, to go, you know, so that it, 
so that it goes small up, you know, like right. that consistently. It's for to calculate your trim is is that sort of linear function by zone to say that like you just multiply the minutes by zone one, two, three, four, or yeah, a couple of slides had it on there, and I can give you the slides too if you want them. But okay, yeah, yeah you would say okay if you were in a zone three, it's been weighted. Those zone charts have been weighted to uh, based on observation with their how they correspond to like lactate levels. So they weight a three maybe by a factor of three. So a minute in zone three, you would get three out of. A minute in zone one, you'd only get one out of. One times one or one times three. So it's more heavily weighted towards the intensity. So, you, you know, uh, I always say it, and I strongly believe it, you get more, you get extra credit for intensity, right? I mean, as long as it's not in too much volume, you know, most people leave intensity out of their, their training, especially as they get older. But um, that's where you know most of the physiological returns come from, the intensity, and then just waiting for them and allowing the the return to come, being patient enough to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm.